Hey everyone, welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 69. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Dave, the salute goes out to you. Hey, hey John. <laughs> Your salute's How's becoming the patented move. Um, <laughs> great to see you. Um, uh, episode 69, uh, the weekly pod where we break down all the top stories we're looking at, all the big news, events we're covering, and also connecting the dots, obviously real-time insights, uh, high-frequency insights we bring to the table with the Cube, and you and I get to riff. Um, interesting week. You were not traveling. You were at the home base in Massachusetts. I was uh, at Black Hat. Um, big news this week going on in the industry. I mean, obviously the week started with a bang last week with the earnings all coming in. Um, kind of across the board this week. I mean, we saw Google lost a huge uh, search monopoly case uh, with the U.S., which is huge. Finally, they got pegged a monopoly when you have 98% share search. Not sure that buying search results on Apple is really the, the killer. It's just that they just dominated. Google killed everybody the past decade and a half, two decades. UK probing Amazon Anthropic Partnership, more regulation problems. Grok raised a boatload with ship company. Um, they're trying to go after NVIDIA. They did a little pivot too. Intel, we covered that last week, big time. Um, also, you got the right calls, and I watched some of the other analysts try to walk back and act like they're relevant, saying oh, that, that, in, that Intel's great still. Um, Dell had a massive bloodletting with the layoffs as they pivot. Dell does this every time, Dave. We've, we've talked about this on the Cube many times in the pod that, that Dell is uh, always wins in transition, and I expect that layoff to be a tell sign for the next generation Dell. We'll get into that ahead. And of course, I was at Black Hat with theCUBE. We did 25, 26 interviews. Uh, Savannah and I did that. We had great content. We had great uh, outpouring of love for theCUBE. As you know, we've been covering RSA since 2018. I saw Michael DeCesar, who's now the president of Abnormal Security. He was at Forescout. He was the first guy that ever brought theCUBE to RSA in NetScout's booth. So a big shout out to Michael DeCesar, who is the president of a company, Abnormal Security, that is absolutely crushing it. And they act, they, they, they're open-minded, they're open. They're going to go public, over 200 million in revenue. So um, Arm is another big company we interviewed there, 200 million in revenue. You start to see the breakout companies in security. We'll, we'll get into that later. And of course, uh, Elon Musk is continuing to piss off everyone and sues the ad industry. Uh, earnings next week from a couple of bellwethers in the infrastructure, Cisco and applied materials. But Dave, the headlines this week is obviously the antitrust and the regulation that's going on in tech, um, absolutely the AI bubble seems to be bursting, but you know, even with AI, there's regulation, but two big notable things on the radar was Google um, is a monopoly, by, and that's gonna be a big impact to Google's business. And then you know, Amazon with Anthropic, I just don't get this one from the UK. Again, more regulation, obviously the big conversation at, at, at Black Hat, even the security conference was the role of AI and explainability, data, supply chain, Security is a data and risk management paradigm at scale. We talked a lot about um, you know, what happened with CrowdStrike and Microsoft. Again, a lot to go in there too. Their critical uh, analysis, core root analysis was done. Um, and Microsoft now is deflecting against Delta saying, we tried to help you. And then, then Microsoft to blame, to shift the blame, throws IBM under the bus. It said IBM was in there too. So, so I mean, we have so much news. There's headlines, there's earnings. Um, Super Micro announced a 10 for one stock split, although the plot stock did drop down. We're having a big event with them this week, with, I think with 20 of their partners. Um, Cyber Arc tops earnings. You have people missing. Uber was up. Love to see that. Um, Equinix raises annual forecast. They're seeing AI growth. Um, and then you're seeing you know, some people missing. You know, Jay Frog, some of the cloud native might be going down a little bit and shifting. Um, acquisitions, we saw Hugging Face bought a company. Um, uh, recently, Box acquired a company. And again, just cybersecurity is out of control. The article by Paul Gillen was pretty, got a lot of traction at Black Hat, the whole tool, tool product sprawl. Uh, and I thought his, his article was exceptional analysis. Uh, and we're seeing a transformation in cybersecurity. So again, that's a rundown uh, in the industry. Um, actually, so hiring too. Sony from uh, Cisco, remember she did that startup. She's now at AMD. Uh, you're starting to see moves around. Um, Cerebras announced some board members uh, there as well. They're going to probably go public. And we got VMware, VMware Explore coming up. So a lot of interesting action 
going on, Dave. Tons. I don't know where you want to start. <laughs> well, Sony, uh, just a, Sony G and G and Donnie, uh, G and Donnie was um, with Pensando, right? And of course, before that, Cisco they they sold. acquired by AMD. So yeah, that's interesting. You know, I'll say this. When the DOJ finally wakes up and realizes Google has a monopoly and they take action against them, you know that Google's monopoly has peaked. That's like a, a <laughs> sure sign that the DOJ coming in, you know, late as usual. And so it reminds me of the DOJ coming in in 1998 uh, with action against Microsoft when they really peaked. You know, Windows 95, I thought, was the Microsoft peak. You know, yeah. it felt like they were insurmountable. And then, of course, we saw the the slow, you know, move to irrelevancy with for years, for like a decade under Balmer with, with Microsoft. Just nobody even cared about them. They still threw off a lot of cash. And, you know, so when the DOJ gets involved, to me, it's a it's a it's a signal that it's it's topped. And so I just and then the anthropic thing is a head shaker, John. I mean, really. Um, and of course, you know, if they're going to do that, they're going to and just talk about DOJ looking into an FTC, the Microsoft open AI, uh, you know, what what Microsoft is doing and others to basically license technology hire people, uh, and then, you know, skirt the M&A friction that they're going to get. So, you know, the tech industry is always like one step ahead of the government. I just don't understand the anthropic move. I mean, there's, there, I read, you know, a lot of the excerpts of the, 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 the implied ruling saying that it's going to hurt competition. I'm like, wait a minute, OpenAI and Microsoft are trying to run away you know, with the prize, mm -hmm. Amazon does a deal with Anthropic, doesn't have a board seat, doesn't even have an advisory board or an observational board seat. It's just investing in the company, you know, being a preferred cloud provider, collaborating on, you know, presumably on, on, on improving Amazon Silicon, um, bellying up to a good partner like that, creating more competition to Google and Microsoft. I just, I don't understand this. There's no competition thing. You've got three huge companies you in the US, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, competing like crazy, you know, keeping prices down. Then you have VMware, Dell, HPE, you know, multi tens of billions of dollars of company companies, Cisco, you know, all essentially doing on-prem cloud, competing with the hyperscalers. So everybody's bashing each other's head in. Technology is deflationary. It's like the only market where price performance keeps improving. And yet they use, like c competition will raise prices. It's it's the most ridiculous thing I've seen. There's no, not collusion, it's just competition. It's good, healthy competition in my, my mind. Now I'll say this, if companies are breaking the law and violating the Sherman Act, they should be punished. I got to go back and read section two of the Sherman Act because I'm not sure what Google has done to violate that by paying Apple a bunch of dough, $20 billion. Yeah. But what's going to happen? They're going to say, okay, now you have to uh, choose as a user which browser you're going to use. Everybody's going to choose Google. No, they're not going to choose Bing. <laughs> it's, yeah. I don't get it. It's just, and then you got perplexity coming up. I mean, they yeah. got competition. Oh, I mean, perplexity is good. Open AI is good. Other search is going to get better. I mean, we're seeing a train training wave going on now. I think by next year, training will be obsolete relative to its innovation as more content, probably multimodal comes on. But still, I think the, the, the tipping point is next year where training as a service is going to happen with AI applications. And you'll see uh, retrieval, which is the hottest app right now in AI, become very important. Google has a real case to say that for the, I, ne I would have never said this ever until this year because Google had a monopoly and they have their monopoly, period, full stop. Anyone who knows Google, they crushed everyone in their way. Any competition was destroyed. They used all the power they could, but they have an argument. They have an argument right now and a defense. And the defense is perplexity is better than Google. In some cases, most cases, open AI is going to get better. And then as you start getting retrieval apps, 
uh, retrieval augmentation generation, RAG, as it's called in the industry, you're going to start to see search as a native feature in all applications. So there's definitely a democratization and shift, a secular shift in search. So if that continues, um, Google has a legit argument saying, look at competitions there, regulators. You know, we have 98%, whatever it is now, but we're going to lose. And I think it, even if they do lose, if they drop to say 80%, they still win. I mean, still gonna, they'll still co-opt it. So, you know, I think Google um, got, has finally been bagged, um, finally. And we knew that advertising was gonna be a bad thing for advertising. I mean, for media companies, and that's why the death of the media companies are everywhere right now. Um, and as people get sick of newsletters, you'll see a new crop of media emerge with AI. And I think there is a shift if that happens, if media goes no display ads, which is volume game, the power law that we put out there for AI models will kick in for content providers and media producers. The creator culture is growing. I mean, Mr. Beast is hiring a CFO right now, right? So, you know, he's got an HR officer. Mr. Beast has got a full-on media franchise. So these individuals are growing. They're going to hit the power law. Some will be big. Some will be mid-range. Some will be long tail. But in digital, it's like record labels, Dave. You know, you're going to have the hits and you're going to have the niches. Yep. And that's the way it's going to be. And Google could be on the wrong side of this with search, traditional search engine. That's a web 1.0 and 2.0 at best. I think YouTube is their wheelhouse. I mean, Google, you got to be loving YouTube. I mean, I bought the service and now the ads are everywhere. I hate it. You know, I loved it at first. I love the multi-view, but you know, I think Google Google has an opportunity to to ride the wave and and ultimately start figuring out where the money is. And then just YouTube TV? Are you talking about YouTube, YouTube TV? YouTube TV. I love right. it. Cut the cord. Um, I no love cable. It too, but it's you, you know what I don't like about it because I use it on my phone. What I don't like about you know how YouTube you can kind of you can shut your phone down, not shut your phone, but but make the screen dark and you still do stuff and it plays. That doesn't happen with YouTube TV. Do you notice that? And it's very sensitive. Anything you touch, it changes channels on you, which is a real pain in the ass. And then the other thing is you can't screenshot anything on YouTube TV. Have you, have you noticed that? They black it out. No, any, I didn't see that. Yeah, any screenshot that you take on YouTube TV, they don't allow you to take it, which is kind of bizarre. But well, I want to say What's that? Oh, go ahead. I want to say something about monopolies. It's not illegal to have earned a monopoly. It is illegal to use that monopoly illegally. and so. I think the, the the courts or the DOJ has to has to prove that, and if they do, then you know Google should get punished. But I saw one analysis. I thought, okay, hey, if Google doesn't pay Apple twenty billion, they just drop twenty billion to their income statement. But one analysis said they would lose thirty billion in revenue. That's after accounting for the twenty billion. So this is basically saying there's a fifty billion dollar swing because of that Apple deal. And that's material. So. That's kind of interesting. I, I'm skeptical that that would happen because I think if a user has a choice, they're going to pick Google. Um, some people are saying, well, even a one percent, two percent, five percent up, you know, bump up in Bing, you know, will will hurt Google and help help Bing immensely. And I'm like, okay, great. So what what's the objective here? We're going to put the handcuffs on Google and we're going to <laughs> monopoly. And we're going to hurt, we're going to help the other monopoly. We're going to help Microsoft. It's like, okay, is it really going to help DuckDuckGo? Or is it going to help Microsoft? You know, I just, so, but to your point, and my earlier point, it's, it's like legacy search. When the DOJ gets involved, it's like, to me, that's the top. And yeah. I'm not saying sell Google. I mean, Google's got a great business. Awesome monopoly. I like, you're right. I like your point about YouTube. But it's like, you know, and the other thing I say is, you know, media is not dead. It's just old legacy media is dead. Yeah. There's a lot of, to your point, there's a lot of really interesting media going on. Of course, you and I had a vision 13 years ago for new media. Yeah, it's going to change. And what's interesting, too, is when you do these these regulators, when they come in, it's interesting the the level of the market that they target. It's almost like Google was too late. They should have been on that earlier. Um, and, and I heard Zuckerberg speak this week too, about how, you know, he started the company and he was like, you know, and it was really fun to see Zuckerberg because obviously I see the revisionist history a little bit, but he's pretty candid. He's not really off. They started out, 
um, with open source. They built their own stuff. They weren't the best. You had MySpace and Friendster. Um, everyone thought it was just a kid thing for schools. And then they're like, okay, they're never going to be profitable. They made money, became profitable. They'll never make the mobile transition. They made the mobile transition. And then they became the leader at that point. And so he basically talked about how companies can do it. Now, he's also speculating in the interview that he really was pissed off the fact that he's beholden to Apple. So you have Meta potentially on the horizon. So the regulators always look at companies when they've well passed their monopoly position and markets are in shift. It happened with Microsoft, with the DOJ, the market went internet, they missed the whole wave. So it can be a really uh, an anchor and a real drag on Google. And the, the key thing is that don't make a Microsoft mistake and miss the next inflection point, which is now that's AI and next generation infrastructure, which we've been covering. And, um, the market's shifting. I mean, just layoffs are everywhere. And Intel announced a bunch of layoffs. Dell laid off twelve thousand people. Today, oh, that, that's not true. That that's not accurate. That twelve thousand number. It's not accurate. That's a wrong number. Yeah, it's pretty accurate. No, um, it isn't. That's not. It, no, it isn't. It, it is. It is. No, it isn't. It is. It's a public it's not. number. It's not twelve thousand. We'll put, we'll put a pin in that. Listeners will come back, and Dave will admit he's wrong uh, no, again. No, you're on the record of saying that it's not true. Because okay. here's why I say. I, I'm, okay. I don't. You may have a source, I don't know, but I have like my brain, my logic here. Okay, I just want to say, if you're going to lay off 10% of your workforce, that's material. So, you know, not it's not a law, but but it's but it's it's smart to to disclose that to the SEC through an 8K or 10K, and and so I don't think it was that high. They're close think, to the line, wherever that line is. We'll come back. I, we'll put a pin I, in that. I, you know, you no. I'm not gonna put I'll a pin hold in. on to my twelve thousand. Okay, but I'm going to say no way. That's that's not accurate because I think we're going to find out. By the way, at the end of August when they okay. report, we're going to find out what the write off is, what the write down is, and we'll be able to compare it okay. to what it was when they laid off. I want to say five thousand earlier this year. I think the numbers in the thousands. But there's no way it's twelve thousand. It's not that high. Well, okay, you, can do, say, you can do the math. I want to say one other thing on before. I, I have a source, but my source could be wrong. But we'll. I'll stick to my twelve thousand. Uh, I want to. I want to say. I want to say. Well, I was you. I was quoted in Silicon Angle. I don't know if you saw that. No, I didn't. No, you should look at it. You should look at the quote. What was the, what was the quote? I basically said it's unlikely the numbers that high because they would, in my in my view, be prudent. If it were that high, that would they would be prudent to file an eight K or do some, file something with the SEC, because to me, that's material. And they didn't. And Dell's not stupid. They actually filed an 8K when it was significantly smaller than than 12.5, which is what Silicon Angle yeah. reported. Well, right. maybe they maybe they staged it out. My point was, is they laid people off. So I was about to get to some other news, which is- Cisco. Wait, 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 wait. Before you go there, I just want to make a point about, before we get <laughs> okay. off monopolies, where, first of all- the We're not United doing monopolies. I'm going to come back to Meta in a second. That's cool. But, but I just want to- follow up on something, the earlier conversation. The U.S. government has been abysmal at regulating uh, tech monopolies. It's horrible. They, they, Lena Khan loves to take credit for AT&T. What a joke. Um, I've talked about this before, so I won't, I won't repeat that. So they're just always late, to your point. 1998 for Microsoft, please. I mean, it was game over by then. Netscape was dead, right? Lotus was dead. Novell was dead. WordPerfect was dead by then. Um, and this is where I think there's this, one of the few instances where our system is deficient and China's is actually much better in this regard because China just says, nope, sorry, Alibaba, no ant IPO for you, boom, kills it. No discussion, no delay, no consensus, <laughs> no call for papers. They just kill it. So... I'm not saying we should be like China, but I'm just saying if we're going to meddle, uh, I, I guess I'm saying don't meddle if you if if you don't have a system to do so when it matters. Because right now, putting the handcuffs on Google, it won't matter, in my opinion. Well, PC Magazine is quoting Silicon Angle um, that roughly 12,500 Dell employees being laid off this week. So that's Silicon Angle report. That's PC Magazine, and then uh, yeah, but the Silicon Angle didn't report that. Silicon Angle said that was unsubstantiated. So okay, well, Dell wouldn't comment. So it's a lot. 
my point is they are a lot and there's news cisco today i don't think it's now. a big deal i think it's a big nothing burger i think dell does this every year every summer dell you know squeezes its uh go to market team and says all right bottom performers out that's what you know jack welch <laughs> and now it's taking their advantage to do that i mean i, I, I just i think it's I mean, I disagree. It's a nothing burger, but I mean, it's it's not it's a something burger when they have to cut that many people. It's a lot of numbers. How many? It's a lot. It's a lot of under Dave. It's a lot of unemployed human beings. Okay, let me just say it that way. And my point is, before we got on a tangent here, was is that Dell laid Intel's laying off a bunch of people that are hitting the streets. Thousands of people. This ain't thirty people in a company. It's thousands, thousands. That's of people. fair, and I don't mean to okay. be insensitive to those okay. people. Thousands paid. of people from Intel. Thousands of people from Cisco just announced today they're planning on another of at least 4,000 more. How many people at Intel? You know, I, I had the number. I'm trying to find it. I think I re I tweeted it out. Uh, it's significant. Intel layoffs. We'll just Google search it real quick. Um, 15,000, roughly, 8, give or take. So, okay. you know, we're in the tens of thousands. So you got Intel. You got um, – we're in a layoff. I've seen startups laying off people. I just saw – um, even Axios is laying people off. They're a media company. That happened this week. Um, they light off 10% uh, of their workforce. Um, this happens in every kind of inflection point. Everyone kind of says, time to lay off people. Let's go. It's, it's okay to cut fixed costs. Um, uh, but that means more people are going to be on the street. Cisco just announced today, breaking news, um, that um, Reuters is reporting. Um, as soon as August 14th, Cisco is going to make another cut. Remember, they announced 4,000 people earlier in the year. Um, so Cisco's trimming, trimming a little bit. And, you know, they were they were non-existent at Black Hat. Um, I didn't see them there, um, but they have eighty nine thousand people. Dell has one hundred and twenty thousand. Again, these are the big companies. So again, it's a signal. And so what I was getting to with the, with the monopoly is is that we're in a market transition. We've been saying this on the cube. I'll keep on saying it because you know the great leaders always say when in transition, and that's the way you got to do it. And we're definitely in a transition. So I was skeptical of regulatory stuff. Because companies like Meta, going back to Facebook and Z and Zuckerberg's comments this week, you know, he was commenting around his neck because you know, look at his age. Twenty years ago, he was a kid. So he's now he's got a family. He's got he's got that look. He's got that whole MMA look going on. And you know, the guy's you know still young, and he's gonna founders in charge. And he's like, he killed the VR side of it pretty much. Go all in on AI, and they are they are as we had predicted. I had said on the queue, you were you and I both said it. Uh, and we said that they're going to be like an AWS for AI, and they're going for it, all in an open source. And by the way, Zuckerberg quoted Open Compute Project, by the way, the other day in the interview. Did he? Which we, yeah, which we pointed out. Yeah, Microsoft and great. Meta were the key open source champions. And Absolutely. Yeah. He, he was saying, I built Facebook because of open source software. So not that saying he's a proponent of open source. Open source helps people. But his point was, is that he was so happy with the Facebook success, but what really bothered him was the fact that Apple had full control, where he was actually, you know, he's been vocal against Apple in the past, even when Jobs was alive. Um, but with Tim Cook specifically, the Apple store has been putting the squeeze on during the mobile generation. So he said, this next wave, they will own everything. Again, why I bring this up is not only is it a monopoly red flag to start evaluating them, if they're going to go there, they might as well start now. But it's more important to what we've been reporting on the Cube and we've been saying on the Cube and the Cube pod this next generation systems revolution is happening where people want to own their stuff. They want to own the stack. They want to own the infrastructure. They want to get down to the kernel level. They want to get down to the silicon performance at large scale. So you have the confluence of cloud computing going next generation, second generation. I call second generation cloud. AWS, the CapExes are up. You're seeing everyone invest in more CPUs and GPUs. So the infrastructure players, AWS, Azure, Microsoft, Google Cloud, doing great. Uh, Oracle is investing. You always talk about Alibaba. They've got their piece. Those players are going to get stronger at scale, especially during the GPU crisis that's that's upon us. People can't run workloads. They can't get GPUs. Basically, it's time sharing, Dave. They're time slicing. GPU is a service. It's basically like the mainframes. You know, your, your time is up, 30 minutes on the terminal. I mean, GPUs are so scarce. So you got to watch Meta. Meta is going to be the one to watch. So the trends, this is a secular trend. This generative AI is a secular infrastructure trend today. And our SuperCloud 7 two weeks ago nailed it. The, the open formats and the catalogs and governance are going to change 
and you're going to start to see intelligent apps right behind all this. So, you know, we're yeah. seeing the signs. And, and the security show this week, Black Hat, clear as day. It's a data problem. We've always said that on the queue, but now it's heightened. Data at scale. I mean, I feel like I'm in a cloud show at these security events. It, it It's the same stuff. End-to-end -end workloads, full observability, governance, risk management. It's like, it's like a cloud show, Dave, but but with risk management, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I think you're going to see a lot more policies and specific things in place with things like the CrowdStrike Microsoft uh, debacle, because um, there's now liability to, to disruption. SLAs are going to change endpoint protection. Vendors are probably going to be multiple vendors. No one's going to bet on one company. It's going to be a real shit show. It's going to be a real bad thing for the industry, but it should be a good thing at the end of the day, because it's going to force heterogeneous, heterogeneous uh, uh, networks and solutions. So again, this 13 categories in security, Dave, 13 network security, endpoint security, cloud oh, security, no. application oh, security, oh, identity oh. access management, data security, audience. threat <laughs> intelligence, agent <laughs> security operations, incident response, governance, risk and compliance, IoT security, security training and awareness, email security security. posture management. I mean, <laughs> managed <off>. services <laughs> security, crypto. Oh, stop, <laughs> stop. <laughs> put me to sleep no and there's like 500 companies in each category it's thousands that's a, <laughs> gillen nailed it oh my god anyway monopoly monopolies can be dangerous wielding the monopoly sword i am very skeptical of the government doing that even when the government can't even get their own shit together we got critical infrastructure um transparency in in elections i'm just not looking at the government as a comfort blanket right now for freedom and security. Uh, they got to up their game. And and there was a so signs of conversations at Black Hat where people were saying the public-private partnerships are the best it's ever been, uh, but still a lot more work to get done. You know, I don't like, know about yeah. that. I mean, maybe in security, maybe. Yeah, it's just, so, well, it's, they, no, they're saying it's better, which it wasn't from a good spot to begin with, but it's Well, incredible. I think, I think uh, okay. You know, I want to pick up on your point about transition. We are definitely in a transition and we've seen others before. This is a case, I always say, it's the, it's very confusing right now and it creates a bit of a vacuum because the, the old legacy stuff is big and it's in decline and the new stuff, the Gen AI stuff, not that big. And it's, it's growing like crazy, but it's tiny. And the new is not big enough to offset the decline in the old and it's not throwing enough cash to be self-funding and as a result, you get these weird dislocations, you get layoffs, you get confusion, CFOs start to pucker up. And so my breaking analysis week, the title of it is cloud spending remains resilient amid market turbulence because the cloud, to your point, is kicking ass. And so I wanted to pull out some CapEx data and I, I pulled out Fitzy stuff, but he doesn't have 24 estimates. So I had to do some research. And by the way, I, used, I tried to use the LLMs to do this, they were shit. They were so bad uh, on the data. So I, I had to go in to all the earnings transcripts and do my own, like, you know, adding up all the quarters. But at any rate, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and Meta, a forecast to spend almost 200 billion this year in CapEx, 195 billion. And collectively, they're growing their CapEx at like 31%. 195 billion. John, the big four hyperscalers are going to do about 200 billion this year. So this, this CapEx spending in 2024 is about the same as the revenue for the big four hyperscalers, big three US plus Alibaba, is about the same <laughs> amount in 2024. Now, the CapEx is going to be here for a long time. It's going to throw off you know, value for years and years and years versus one year of revenue. But my point is that Jassy and Nadella and Pichai and Zuck are steadfast in their belief, despite all this market turbulence that we saw with you know, the Nikkei dropping by 12%, the US markets following suit, um, getting hammered, coming back a little bit. But the AI, you know, when this happens, you know, when you get, well, so what triggered it was, at least in part, was the, the, the Japanese central bank raised its benchmark um, rate, which it hadn't done like done once in 17 years. So what all these investors and do is they they basically hedge, they, they they borrow yen and then they invest in assets that 
give them a higher return. So when the interest in yen goes up, their their borrowing costs go up and they get screwed. And so they freak out. So what do they do? They sell inflated assets. So they sell AI stocks, Nvidia got hit, and they sell Bitcoin. So you saw that those two sectors got, you know, really, really hit hard. You know, Apple held up pretty well, actually, but then Buffett sells half his Apple. So that freaks people out. Meta had a good quarter, so they held, kind of held up well. Amazon missed on the retail side, even though AWS kicked ass. Microsoft, you know, didn't beat by as much as they everybody thought they were going to beat. So they kind of pulled back a little bit. All the semiconductor stocks got hit. And it's it created this kind of confusing market. You add in, you know, turmoil in the Middle East, an election year. And but the stock market holding up pretty well. I mean, it's you know, doing well today, did okay yesterday. So well, I think the problem I, I think the tech, I think the tech industry there's, there's some job reports came out, but I think the tech industry is really going through a, a recession more than the rest of the I think the numbers from other other industries cover the tech. Tech is definitely bleeding. Uh, I mentioned some of the layoffs, and I mean, the, the signs are there, Dave, that we are in a pre-2008 kind of vibe. It either doesn't happen like a pop, or the air lets out of the balloon quietly and slowly where it gets simmered down. Because I think, again, we pointed this out many times here, the hyperscalers are, are a big part of how fast things could move. And again, I think this is why you see these shifts happen so quickly now versus like you know, years. Uh, when the dot, when the dot bomb the dot com bubble crash took years to recover, the 2008 crisis took at least two years or more. Some will say three. Oh, um, and, that, and, <laughs> and now I think that the, the correction could be shortened. I mean, AI and the technology is shrinking time to blank, time to value for startups and companies time to make pivots, time to create increased trajectory and growth. And it also creates time for corrections. So, so I think you're going to see a fast correction. Um, again, you don't want to be on the wrong side of history. And this is where I, the earnings are interesting to read the tea leaves. I mean, the companies that I was mentioning earlier at the top at, at Black Hat that were doing well were the ones that have ARR. It's, it takes two seconds to install the product to get instant value. And you can see it and it's easy to work with. That's kind of like a success formula when you have things that are hard and complex, um, like we're seeing now with with hybrid cloud and distributed edge. So, um, and again, well, and then the chips are going to get faster, so, cheaper too. So, so everybody's worried about inflation now. A month ago, it was like the Fed's got the soft landing. It's they've architected it. You know, all the all the indices were hitting their highs, and then you know you get a sort of little little job reports that's not great. CPI number. Um, okay but people are now worried about recession you know the growth numbers right so all of a sudden i hear this listen to jeremy siegel i think it was on monday saying we need an emergency rate cut of three quarters of a percentage point and i'm like whoa take a breath and so the big question i have is okay so maybe there are some inflationary pressures we'll see if the soft landing can be achieved it's very hard to do i, I realize that but AI is deflationary, and that's what's going to be really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll we'll see how that affects the economy. It could be a double whammy with all these layoffs. And by the way, again, I didn't mean to be um, uh, non non empathic to those people that are getting laid off. It sucks, especially if we're in, like you say, we're in kind of this tech recession or shadow recession, you know, where people are getting laid off. And AI is going to fill a lot of those jobs. I think I think AI, you know, people worry about AI you know, taking jobs. I think tech is actually exposed. And why do I think that? I think that because tech companies are going to be the ones who are in the best position to aggressively use AI. You know, IBM with this huge services arm. You know, you talk about Dell having, you know, series of layoffs this year, Cisco, Intel. Well, Intel's different. Intel's just going to run out of money if they don't lay people off and cancel their dividend. But, you know, to your point, um, this is going to be an interesting transition to see. And I think it's going to be, you know, it's going to be pretty rocky. It's never smooth, these things. They never go linearly from the old to the new. It's always some bumps in the middle, crossing the chasm, missteps, whatever you want to call it. And I think it's going to shake some things out. I, I, I really do.
Well, I think I think the key is that the market's transition, the products are in transition, the platforms are in transition, the hardware and the chips are in transition. They're all changing. And yeah. when I see regulation like Google, that don't really bothers me as much. They kind of deserved it, in my opinion. Not that I hate like to see that on anybody. I like Google a lot. Um, and they're at local here in the valley. Um, where I get pissed off and I get nervous, I don't have confidence. I'm not enthusiastic in any way. In fact, I'm skeptical. Um, is that when the government starts getting involved in the AI stuff, which I get guardrails, and I've been on this thing for, you know, I've said it really bluntly, like I think it's a joke that they'd even try to regulate AI before I even know what it is. Guardrails, I can buy the guardrails as kind of like a virtue signaling. But when you start getting legislative efforts, like in California, there's oh. a bill to safe and secure AI models. I mean, there is so much wrong with this because like things like when you don't know what you're doing, um, there's so much that could go wrong. Like what does hazard mean? Like what does, um, how do you put thresholds on on compliance? And just everybody's weighing in on this. Martin Casada wrote a tweet um, on this um, that he posted. And um, the Senator from California, Scott Weiner's the guy, okay. Um, he he's the one who's putting together. It's just a lot of false claims. And, and the outcry is coming from Andrew Ning at Stanford, um, Ian Stoka from Berkeley is also involved in Databricks. You know, people who are who are in the research side and on the commercial side, so they're close to both worlds and academia and startups and then commercialization. You know, foundation models are still ambiguous. The definitions and thresholds and risks, we don't know what it is yet. So when you don't have what it is and the cost involved in training is so high, you know, wait a minute, let why are you meddling with this? There's a lot on the line. There's a lot going on. And the consequences of fucking up the machinery, if you will, is high. So you stifle innovation and unnecessary compliance burdens. It's just terrible. I just totally against it. I mean, and it's yeah. just, it's just, it, just get out of the way, let it rain and then rain it in. Like, that's what you got to do. <laughs> so, you know, the Berkeley folks are freaking out. Why? Because they're the ones that, you know, usually protest things like this and they're they're taking the other side safety auditing and full shutdown capabilities what are you kidding me i think um i mean that's what they want they want real auditing real time and full shutdown capabilities like an, an emergency shutdown pull the plug so i think part of the problem is that you know government's full of smart people they're not idiots even though we like to say they're idiots and they so what happens is they start you know under better understanding technology and trends and they dig into it and they, oh, they, they start to understand things like how LLMs work and and the weights and they start talking about, you know, I've seen a lot of these proposals around, well, we want to, you know, assess the weights and we want to have people evaluate the innards of the model. And that's not, in my opinion, anyway, the role of government. I think the role of government should be to, to look at the laws that are on the books today, like fair use and say, okay, Given that, you know, that law was written whenever it was written, and it was, you know, in the context of the internet, which is like the ancient times compared to what we are today, how does fair use apply in this new era? That's what the government should be spending its time thinking about, not worrying about how the models work, inside models, like you say, shutting them down. I mean... Yeah, no, I mean, look, let me be clear. Let, let me be clear. When I use, when I'm the hyperbole of me calling them idiots, it's just a broad statement. I shouldn't say that. When I did the research for the Jedi contract, when Microsoft was getting challenged by the smear campaign by Oracle and all the others, IBM and, and even Microsoft had their hands and everyone wanted Amazon to lose that or not win the deal. That was the goal. I learned a lot. There are tons of people in DC that are really smart, are curious and want to learn. And the younger demographic, the younger uh, sir, um folks serving in government, uh, do the right thing. It's when it gets politicized, Dave, or this posturing. So um, that's when it gets corrupt and idiotic, in my opinion. So you got to be careful. And this is where I trust um, the academics on this side, whether it's Berkeley, Santa Barbara, Martin Casada, who's smart, a lot of people weighing in. And this is what the government has to do going forward. They need to put a, assemble real experts, not posers, not pretenders, is pretenders and posers. The posers are the ones that are rich and haven't put their hands on anything. We all know who they are. And they should just get a real group of, of people together and use the collective intelligence of the crowd and the experts to weigh in on this and take the temperature. 
slow it down. But forcing it for like, look what I'm saving you, all you people out there. I'm, I'm the protector. I'm the protector of the realm. Now, come on, enough. <laughs> so I, I think that's the that's the problem I have. And there's the way to do it and there's a way not to do it. And most lo legislators, Dave, are lawyers. And so, yeah, they'll give you a dissertation on fair use, but they won't understand what the internet is. Never mind, you know, the ins and outs of a frontier model or a large model that costs billions to train that have val that has value. And it's only the beginning. So, but again, is is to me the focus should be on if an LLM like Perplexity is going to use data from whatever the New York Times you know, Reddit or whatever, so they get paid. Well, we, we're seeing the tech companies actually be pretty proactive about that and cutting deals. But to me, that's where the government can play a useful role. Say, okay, hey, here's some either guidelines or laws that say this, this is something that is theft. This isn't. You know, what is that line? Not, okay, let's, like you said, Let's see how this model can be shut down. Things are going to change so fast. I mean, if, if, it's like it's like the guy at SuperCloud. I think it was SuperCloud Five said. He said, "You know, if if AI and AGI if actually happens, it's going to be smart enough to fake us out to make us think that we're not here yet, and it's going to be smart enough to to get around such things." So. <laughs> The government's not going to be able to adjudicate that. So <laughs> I do think, you know, it's interesting to see what's happening in open AI with Ilya and other folks leaving. Yeah. You know, I do hope that the industry, you know, you know, that's the flip side of this is can the industry self-regulate? And I don't know the answer to that. Well, a lot going on next week. Um, we got a big uh, summer. I mean, it's so busy. We're going to have a three-day event with Super Micro. We're streaming on Friday, Dave, the... Um, our inaugural Silicon Valley AI leaders. I got VJ who heads up the wireless technologies over at Broadcom coming on. He also works with Charlie Kawaz on the chip side. About a week from a week from today. A week from today. The, the um, NYSE Wired collaboration. That's the Cube, yes, yeah, the Cube Plus NYSE. We um, interviewed all the semiconductor leaders and leaders awesome. in AI infrastructure, including storage, by the way, because it's still, you know, as Charlie Giancana said from Carlos said from Pure. Um, they're not a storage company. They happen to have storage, but all flash. They made that bet, and they're they got they they're well positioned for the the future of AI, and they got some they got some great product coming out. So you heard the same narrative from Vast, like ne next phase beyond storage. That was our earlier phase. Yeah, I mean it's going to be weird to see how all that you know it's like fashion. Never fight fashion. Um, so that's going to be an event. We got um, New York City will be on August twentieth and twenty first. I'll be there. We'll be um, opening up um, the dry runs of our NYSC facility uh, studio there with big announcement coming up in a couple months um, or next month. Stay tuned for that. And then I'm really excited this year to um, see what Broadcom does with VMware's event Explore for the 15th year covering, uh, 16th year actually, because it's 2015, 2010 was the first year. We've been to every VMware Explore. And before VMware, VMworld, Broadcom, this is the second first, year of uh, ownership. This is the full year VMworld under the belt. Was, our first VMworld was 2010. 2010, right? 16th In the year. Of Moscone South. That was awesome. Yeah. I mean, we've been, we've seen, we've seen the movie a few times around the track. Um, we've seen, you know, we've seen the, we've seen the wave. So Dave, what's going to be interesting about VMware, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I got to tell you. You know, they've revamped their partner network, but maybe it's been a little bit too late, day late and a dollar short, because this, the vibe is partners are not happy. And meanwhile, we've been covering on the business side, VCF is doing well as is private AI. Tanzu is not getting the spotlight, but they're doing good too. And Spring, talk about a resurgence of, of C programmers. Um, there's a massive surge back to, to Spring. So uh, it never left, actually. They're actually increasing their community. So you know, VMware just might get lucky at that they don't crater. And that Hawk Tan's genius on this was to trim it down, but they have they have some integration pains. We're gonna we're gonna cover that in depth. So not sure what to expect yet, but we'll be there in force. We'll be chasing down all the data. We got two sets. We're gonna be doing special uh, employee, not employee, uh, customer roundtables. 
Um, the ecosystem is changing. VMware is becoming much more of a mature and could win that operating layer for the workloads, especially think, with GPUs. I think the thing to watch there is, you know, as Broadcom narrows down the customer base, simplifies the packages, charges more, invests in R&D, you know, what's the degree to which they can transition people out of the ELAs, maintain enough customers to actually, you know, go all in. And you can't tell from the ETR spending data because it's all account-based and they're narrowing down the number of accounts. So the ETR data looks horrible for VMware, um, but it doesn't capture the spend level. And that's going to be the key. And we'll, we're only going to see that from what Broadcom reports and its earnings and what we'll pick up at places like uh, VMware Explore when we talk to customers. Yep. Yeah. And then on, I got a big exclusive interview with one-on-one -on -one with Matt Garman, the CEO of AWS. That should be good. If, any, if you're listening to this, you want to send me a DM, you want any burning questions for the, the man with his hand on the wheel of the ship uh, at AWS. Um, I've known Matt Garman for many, many years. I like Matt Garman. I think he's going to be a good CEO. I'm, 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 I like him. So I think, you know, he is maybe got into the mission a little bit sooner, but he's got the chop. So we'll see. I'm going to grill him pretty hard, Dave. So, you know, I'm going to ask it. Silicon, baby. <laughs> we just had an exclusive, me, Rob Hof, and George Gilbert with Benoit Dajaville, who wanted to come back to us after SuperCloud 7 to just clarify some of the statements that Databricks has made um, that we kind of bought into. He wanted to say, hey, you guys, you guys missed some things. So we're going to be reporting on that. And of course, we're going to talk to Databricks to get their take on all this. Um, so that's going to be interesting. We continue to, you know, see the fallout from SuperCloud 7, the whole governance confusion. Um, and if we didn't talk at all about Delta Airlines and CrowdStrike and Microsoft, we're probably out of time. Yeah. Um, but Well, you know, Dave, have a great weekend. That's it. I got to jump. I have to uh, have a busy day. We're going to jump on a plane heading back east this uh, next two weeks. I'll be in Boston and I'll see you in Boston, the team, yeah. and then New York uh, for... Uh, Business in New York. We got a great lineup with CISOs, NYSC, and a bunch of startups on the infrastructure side. So um, we'll be recruiting AI infrastructure leaders in New York City. So um, I'll hook up with Vertex Ventures. Megan Reynolds has got a great firm over there. Um, and you got folks on the East Coast like Ed Sim, Bold Start. You got um, you got work, Workbench VC is hot down there. A lot of great action going on in New York right now, Dave. So. Um, Place to be, John. We'll be there. We'll place to be. All right. We'll see you next time. All right. Have a good weekend.